Hello. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be talking hopefully a little bit more briefly than in the last video about hypothesis testing, how to actually implement it and how to implement it in R. Uh, so I've got some uh, some stuff here. I'm going to load up. I've loaded up these packages, the tidyverse here. I'm actually just loading up because it has a data set I'm going to use uh, JTools to look at my regressions, uh, car, which has a, a hypothesis testing function in it, and then VTable just to look at our data. We're going to load up the Texas housing data set from uh, the dplyr package, which is in the tidyverse. Let's go ahead and look at that housing data set and see what we have. Uh, so uh, we have city, we have year, we have month, we have the sales. Uh, we also have the volume of sales, the, uh, the median list uh, price, uh, the number of listings, the inventory, and the date. We're going to run a regression of the number of listings uh, on uh, the amount of time that it would take to clear out your inventory. Uh, and uh, does this regression make a lot of sense? No, not really. Let's not think too hard about it. We're just sort of doing some, uh, some examples here. Uh, so we're going to regress the number of listings on the amount of inventory. And we're going to use the Texas housing data set. Okay, so we're going to store that regression there. Uh, so the first thing let's do, let's go ahead and look at those regression results. We're going to use export sums uh, to look at our regression results. Let's, let's uh, do it in a little bit more detail. So let's add some uh, extra digits after the decimal place and see what we have. Okay, so the coefficient on inventory, our beta 1, is negative 129.9. We want to characterize the uncertainty of this. Uh, so by default in the... Um, in the regression table by itself, we have the standard error of 15.282. So by standard in a regression table, uh, you're going to have uh, the coefficient. Uh, and then below that coefficient, you're going to have some measure of uncertainty. Uh, in economics, at least, most of the time, that's going to be a standard error. In some other fields, by default, they will show you the t-statistic instead. Uh, we also have here these stars. Uh, so it is typical to see stars like this on a regression table uh, or any other sort of statistical table. What they tend to mean is that this coefficient is statistically significant at a particular significance uh, level or better. Uh, or, uh, and so uh, in this, we have a little key here saying what these stars mean. So here, triple stars means that it is significant. Uh, it has a p-value below 0 0.001. So it is statistically significant at an alpha of 0.1%. Okay, so uh, if we gave it, if we had an alpha of 0.1%, we would say that this coefficient is statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, so keep in mind, uh, by default, these uh, these tests are, are comparing to a null of zero. So that's only those stars are really only interesting if our null that we're interested in is zero. Okay, so we have our uh, our results, and so from this we can already sort of characterize some of that uncertainty. I can sort of imagine a normal distribution with a mean of negative 129 and a standard deviation of 15. Uh, and sort of think about what might be likely to occur uh, in there. So, you know, something within a range of uh, 129 minus 15 to 129 plus 15, very, very likely. Uh, if I want to sort of eyeball whether it's significant at the 95% level, I can see whether or not uh, the coefficient is two times bigger uh, than, the standard, than the standard error there. Uh, here it clearly is, right? Two times the standard error would be 30. We're much bigger than that in absolute value. So this is clearly significant at the 95% level. Uh, which we can also see by the fact that it has uh, one star or more here. Uh, so let's also uh, see what we can do a little bit more precisely. So I can have export sums give me a t-statistic or a z-statistic or a, a p-value uh, by, by specifying the uh, error format. I can do something like uh, statistic, and it would show me the z-score, uh, or I can do um, p-value, and it would give me the p-value. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it by hand because that's, that's a good, good habit to get into. So let's extract the coefficient and the standard error and see what we can do uh, with that. So the way you can get a coefficient out of a regression object in R is with the coef function. So I'm going to do coef of m, see what that gives us. So that gives us the intercept of 4,164 and the inventory coefficient of 129. Cool. Uh, I want the second one of those. Uh, so if I do this, I'll get the second one. Uh, notice it's named here. Uh, sometimes I don't want that name, in which case I will just do the double square brackets. So there's my coefficient. How about the standard error? It's a little bit more annoying to get the standard error out, but you can do that first of all by doing a summary of your model. So this is, you know, if you don't use export sums, you can see all the information about your model with a summary. Uh, and then I'm going to get the coefficients object out of my summary. So what does that give me? That gives me that this little table in here, right? The coefficients table. Uh, so I get that information here. And I want the second column, because that's where the standard errors are, so comma 2. And I want the second row, because that's got my standard error of the inventory in it. So I'll do 2, 2. All right, there we go. There's our number for the standard error. Uh, so the first thing let's do, let's calculate a z-score. So the z-score is going to be our estimate 
Uh, so let's store our estimate. So this is our beta one hat. This is our SE of beta one. So our Z score is going to be our beta one hat minus whatever our, our null, dist our null uh, value is. So let's say that that's zero. Let's start with a zero. And then we divide that by SE of beta one. So we get a Z score of oops, negative 8.5. Uh, if I go back up here and tell it to give me the z-score, I should get negative 8.5. There we go. We did it properly. Um, what we can also do from this is, uh, is we can get z-scores of different nulls, uh, which is a little bit more difficult to do uh, with export sums by itself. So let's say we wanted to test if this coefficient was equal to, let's say, 100. Uh, so then we can get the z-score of that. So let's, let's call this something else, z of 100. So that z-score is only fit negative 15. Okay, so we've got some z-scores that we can work with. Uh, now that we want to figure out uh, what is the p-value from this z-score, uh, how unlikely is it to get a co an estimate like this given the null that we have assumed. So the key here, and really the key in all of hypothesis testing, uh, is to try to identify the correct null distribution. This is always the hardest part. And this is why we sort of do all these backflips and all these calculations. It's why we're doing this sort of z-score calculation because we know that the, the sampling distribution of a beta of an of a OLS coefficient is normal, right? And if we subtract them, and it, th that normal distribution has a mean of whatever the, the true null is and the standard error of whatever the standard error is, or the standard, standard deviation of whatever the standard error is. And we also know that from a normal distribution, if we subtract out the mean and divide by the standard error, uh, we have a standard normal distribution, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And so by doing this calculation, we know what our null distribution is. It is the standard normal distribution. So we can use the standard normal distribution to see how far out we are. Uh, so we can use the p-norm function. What this will do is this uses the, I mean, by default, the standard normal distribution. And it will tell me how much area there is to the left of whatever value I give it on the standard normal distribution. So if I give it the z-score that I have, it will tell me that uh, very, 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 very little of the area. So this is 9.34 times e to the negative 18. That means 9.34 times 10 to the negative 18. So that's uh, divided by 10 to the power of 18, which is a really, really big number we're dividing by. So it's a very tiny number that we end up with. So this is saying that there's very, very little area to the left of our z-score on the standard normal distribution. Um, and uh, because this is a negative z-score, that's telling me that there is very, 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 very little area that is as low or lower than our z-score uh, relative to the uh, null of zero that we are assuming. Uh, if I want to do a two-sided test, and this is my p-value. This is a one-sided p-value because this is the, the uh, area to the left of the, that is the area outside of our z-score given our true null distribution. If I want to do a two-sided test and get the p-value of that, all I have to do is take this and multiply it by two. There we go. Now, something to note, this calculation that we did only works for negative z, right? What if we had a positive z? Well, it would still give us the area to the left of the distribution. But if we have a positive z, if we're to the right of our true value, then the left of that includes our null, which we don't want. We want the area outside, not the area to the left. Uh, so if we were, um, if we had a, uh, a, a positive z, we would want to do one, uh, one minus one minus p norm of z. Uh, that would give us the area to the right of the, uh, the z score. So if we want a positive one, we want to the right. And if we want to two sided, it would be two times one minus p norm to the z. Right. We can test this, by the way. Uh, let's let's take this and let's say we have a, let's say we got a z score of 1.96. As we know, that's the critical value. If we are further than that, we, then we're gonna be statistically significant at the 95% level. So this should have 2.5% to the right of my positive z-score of 1.96. Uh, so there's 2.5% to the right. A two-sided test would be 5% on either side. So there we go, 0 0.025 if you round. Uh, okay, so that's how we can get a p-value using our coefficient and our standard error. That's how we can pull the standard error and p-value out. We can also calculate a 95% confidence interval from this by just taking that critical value, uh, which I'm gonna say is 1.96. So we have our coefficient, beta one uh, hat, I'm going to subtract out 1.96 times our standard error. That's the left side of our confidence interval, our 95% confidence interval. If we just do this plus, we would get the right side of our confidence interval. So that gives us a 95% confidence interval uh, by pulling out the, the, co the coefficient and the standard error. 
so that's a way we can work with these hypothesis tests by hand, which is a good way of sort of getting used to them. Uh, how about where does 1.96 come from? That's just sort of a number that we know for 95% confidence intervals with a null hypothesis distribution, uh, or no, a null, uh, null distribution of normal. Um, but uh, you can you can get those confident those uh, critical values in other ways. Um, but we're not really going to be doing this by hand that often, so I, let's just stick with 1.96 for now. What we will do is let's go ahead and uh, do some uh, other ways of doing tests. We're going to use the linear hypothesis function, which comes from the car package. All right, so we got that from here. Uh, and what this does is this lets us test a linear hypothesis that we are interested in. So we just give it the model, and then we tell it what te what uh, what test we want to run. So let's test whether uh, uh, what was it? Inventory is zero, right? So this is going to do an F test, not a normal test, but when we only have one coefficient, it should be the exact same thing. Uh, so here we get uh, a p-value that's very, very small, which we also got a p-value that was very, very small before. An F test uh, compares the ratio of squares, uh, which basically what it's doing is it's comparing a model fit of one variable of one model to a model fit of another. And the comparison we're doing here is a model fit that includes the inventory variable against a model fit that does not. Uh, so that's what the F test is doing. If you only have one variable, it should give you the exact same result. Uh, but we can also, uh, one reason we can do this is without doing it by hand, we can test other sorts of uh, uh, linear hypothesis tests in the same way. So instead of doing a null of zero, which the table will give us, I can do a null of 100, and it will give me that test as well, which is still a very, very tiny uh, p-value. Um, okay, one other thing we can do with the linear hypothesis is that we can add on robust standard errors. So we can do the exact same test, but this time with robust standard errors, which is another benefit of using linear hypothesis. Linear hypothesis is also going to be good to know because once we get to uh, multivariate regressions with many variables in them at once, uh, we can more easily compare uh, different coefficients or perhaps test multiple coefficients at the same time. All right, that's the basic rundown of actually implementing some hypothesis tests with a normal null uh, and a little bit with an F distribution null. And that's it. Thank you.